Someday, you know, it's going to be a reality. I'm going higher someday. It's going to be a reality. We're singing about it. That's really going to happen. That's not just a popular tune that it'll be out of style tomorrow and some other song will replace it. Nothing's ever going to replace that. That's the difference between us and the world. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray just a moment. Father, again, we come in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> thanking and praising me already for your sweet spirit. Oh, God. Lord Jesus, inside we felt like dancing around. We're thankful for that feeling. Oh, God, that comes from Jesus. Someday it'll be a reality. I believe we'll all be dancing someday, Lord. I don't know what that's going to be like, but I believe we'll join David and dance before the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Jesus, I pray you'll give me a new anointing from heaven and give divine illumination upon the Word. Speak to our hearts once again, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, how much we need Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the book of Joshua, the first chapter, and begin reading with the first verse. Joshua, the first chapter, verse 1. I enjoyed that song the choir sang too, and I don't remember the name. I don't even remember hearing it sung that way. But there's another words to that too, isn't there? I am the Lord that healeth thee. Seems to me like I heard that in Doctor Tozer's church. There is a great physician still, whose hand has all its ancient skill. It goes on something else there. I am the Lord that healeth thee. It's the same tune. Beautiful. But it brought it back as we were singing. These words are beautiful too, and wonderful. Well, the whole service tonight, I don't know. <laughs> I'd have been happy not to even preach. I was enjoying what we were in. Glory. Well, Joshua 1, chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, my servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, down all this people into the land which I do give to them. I want you to notice the wording, the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Because remember, God is speaking to us in all of the word. He's speaking to us. <clears throat> Something he wants to give us, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. As I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. And this book of the law, <clears throat> and this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be it strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. The text that I want to use tonight, <clears throat> verse 3, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. Now, that's rather an interesting statement. Notice what God said, and we sometimes sing it if we're not careful. We, we get... Well, I don't know how we want to put it. It's true. Jesus paid it all, and he did. God of all grace, and he is, and it's all of God, and it is. 
want you to notice here, these, and if we're not careful, we'll sit down and say, wonderful, salvation, it's all of God, God has to save us, and so forth. That's wonderful, and that's true. But notice this. God said, I've given you something, but you have to take it. I have given it to you, but you are going to have to fight for it. How is that something? If, you, if I give you a gift, you think all you have to do is receive it. Now, in this case, that's true of some things, but that's not true here. This, this is, is a land of possession. And anything that lies in the land of possession, you have to take. Now, if it's salvation, he gives that to you and you receive it. But in the possession, he's given that to you also, but you have to take that. You receive salvation, but you take the possession. I have given you the land, now go in and possess it. I have given it to you, but you have to possess it. So it's interesting that God gives us something and then tells us we have to fight for it. <clears throat> he tells us to fight for it, be strong, be very courageous, be careful, obey God. He's telling us now how to fight for it. Meditate on the Word, do what we find in it, and be not afraid, be not dismayed. The Lord thy God is with thee. He's telling us here now how to fight for our possession. I want you to notice, there is a land of possession. Crossing Jordan was a great miracle. God led them up to the Jordan River, and that was God's part to part the waters. The Israel could do nothing about that. It is a tremendous miracle. But the crossing of Jordan got them on the other side, but they did, that did not give them the land. God pro produced a great miracle in dividing the waters of the Jordan River, but I want to tell you from on the other side, every place they got was a possession they had to fight for. So crossing the Jordan was a great miracle, but that did not give them the land or did not give them their possessions. Canaan, God's promise, but they had to get their feet on it. Now when they were down in Egypt, they didn't have to fight for it because there wasn't anything down there God wanted them to get their feet on. That's the sinners out in sin, and there's nothing there God wants you to get your feet on, and you don't have to fight for a thing. You wait and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He's going to take care of this. You just trust Jesus. So there's nothing down there you have to fight for, and there's nothing there he wants you to get your feet on, and, uh, but you just trust God. Now, in Egypt, the enemy was open. They didn't have to fight in Egypt, but they still saw their enemy. They knew who he was, and it was easy to see. So at salvation, we stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But when they got into the wilderness now, they found another enemy, a different kind of an enemy. An enemy that was <laughs> he's sneaky. He snuck up on them. And uh, he, it says in Deuteronomy 25, this enemy... Uh, was a new enemy, an unexpected enemy. And Amalek, they met Amalek, a type of the flesh uh, who was trying to keep them from their possession. Now, I want you to notice the enemy they met in the, in the wilderness. There was still no place of possession there. That enemy was trying to keep them from their possession. In Deuteronomy 25, it says, He smote the hinder part, even the feeble behind thee, and when they are faint and weary, the enemy knows when to attack us. When we're faint, when we're weary, and uh, when we have a little tendency to lag behind, he knows when to jump on. That's when he's going to get, get jump on you. So the devil attacks us in our weakest spots when we're weary and faint, and that's when he attacks. Now, how did they overcome Amalek? Amalek is a type of the flesh. And I want you to know that conquering the flesh is not a possession. 
I think sometimes we think it is, we conquer the flesh, we think we've gained it, but that's no possession. The flesh is a hindrance to our possession. So, uh, they conquered Amalek mainly as Joshua, Jesus, our leader, fighting against the enemy by prayer, Moses on the mountain, so by prayer and resisting the devil, we conquer Amalek in the flesh. Amalek was beaten, the Bible says, but not destroyed. He would be around from generation to generation, and every young generation that comes along, they're going to meet him. The parents may win the battle, but the children are going to find he's there, and they're going to have to fight him too. And he'll try to keep you from your possession. Now, as I said, Egypt had no place to get their feet on. There was no possession there. The wilderness also was a place where there was no possession. God never said to them, I'll give you a foot of ground in the wilderness. He never said, I'll give you any of it. None of it belongs to you. He only wants you to get out of there. That's all. So conquering the flesh is not a possession, but it is a hindrance to our possession. Many of God's children are trying to get their feet on earthly possessions, wealth and fame and popularity and high positions and worldly achievements. Now, if God gives you any of these, that's fine. But we're not to strive to get our feet on them. We're to strive to get our feet on eternal things. Things you can take to heaven with you. And that's going to be a reality someday. No man can take a bank account with him uh, or worldly achievements. Now, we need bank accounts. Don't misunderstand me. We have to have bank accounts to pay our bills and... And, uh, but we can't take it to heaven with us. Our possessions are things that we can take to heaven with us. Anything you can take with you is a possession. Nothing else is. So everything spiritual will be yours forever. Canaan was a land where they... Now, I want you to notice this. In, in, in Egypt, uh, God took care of that enemy. In the wilderness, the enemy snuck up and fought them. But in Canaan, they attacked the enemy. I want you to get this distinction. When the devil is fighting you and slipping up on you and accusing you and causing things to the flesh, that is, that is not a possession, but a possession is something you attack and take. Now, there are things in us that we need to, I saw in my own heart a couple of weeks or so ago, something in me that I saw needed to be taken out, and I had to cry to Jesus, oh, Jesus, cleanse me of that, but that's not a possession. And I'm thankful Jesus can cleanse us of it. When he shows us we need to be cleansed of it, we need to get rid of it, because that enemy will keep us from our possessions. So Canaan was a land where they attacked the enemy, and they took the ground from him. So, God has promised no ground in Egypt, no ground in, is in Israel, but he has promised ground in Canaan, a possession which we must fight for. Now, Jericho was the first city and that they could get their feet on, but that was uh, something that belonged to Jesus. It was the first fruits that went to them. The Gibeonites came along and they missed that one. They didn't get their feet on the Gibeonites because they didn't ask counsel of the Lord. And I love that beautiful story of uh, Caleb and Joshua 14. I don't know if I, admit, if I can find that. I'd like to read just a little bit of that in the 14th chapter of Joshua. I think that's so beautiful. Here is a man, 85 years of age, the 14th chapter of Joshua, and the 14th chapter is starting the 7th verse. We have the story, first of all, of uh, the 13th chapter is a beautiful chapter, or there's God is talking to Joshua, and Joshua's an old man. He said, uh, God said, Joshua, you're old and feeble now, and uh, but he said to him, 
there is the 13th chapter, the first verse, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. There's a good text for all you older senior citizens. I don't care what's happened in your life. I don't care what you've conquered. I don't care what you've done. There's one word to you. There is still yet much land to be possessed. Glory. <laughs> That's an encouragement to older saints. There's still a lot to be conquered. Still a lot of possession out there. Yet much land to be possessed. Well, look at his friend Caleb. Oh, there in the 14th chapter. And he went to Joshua, and he, the uh, 7th verse, is, and he's talking to Joshua. He said, Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. I love that. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thou thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and the children for and, and thy children's forever. And that's something. Here's something you can gain an inheritance for your children. And thy children forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord thy God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. As he said, these forty and five years, ever since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old, eighty-five years old, as yet I am as strong this day as I was in that day and the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. I like that. He's going to, what he's going to, he's after a possession. He's out of the wilderness, but he is after a possession. And there's a great mountain there, and he's 85 years old, and he still wants to possess it. That is, there's, I don't care, as long as we're still living, I don't care how old, old you are, there's still something God wants you to possess and get your feet on. So, uh, he said, Now therefore give me this mountain where the Lord spake in that day, and for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that cities were great and fenced, great, tremendous mountain, and great giants, and great cities. But if so be the Lord be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. I read one commentary, I thought it was good. Caleb never used the word lucky. <laughs> he said, if God be with me, I'll be able to do it. And I think uh, this scholar, whoever it was, this scholar said, uh, I think it was pink, he said, uh, the word lucky is a heathen word. I was lucky. God's children are never lucky. What you have, God's given you. Everything, we ought to praise God for everything comes from Him. Every good and every perfect gift cometh from above. If it's come to you, it's God's hand. We ought to praise God for it. Never say I'm lucky. It's been God's marvelous gift. He said, if God be with me, I'll be able to do it. He knew he couldn't do it on his own. And he knew that. And it's good that we know that. But God will give it to me. And so this dear man, uh, at 85 years of age, knew that there were possessions out there. Now there are possessions. Look at Ephesians. And I know you know these verses, but I think it's good to turn and look at them again. Ephesians, what is it, the first chapter? <clears throat> and where Jesus, Paul, is praying for the church at Ephesus, they'll know the exceeding greatness uh, of God's power toward us who believe. And he's praying for them. And uh, the exceeding greatness of God's power to us was the 19th verse. Who believe according to the work of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things of the church which is body, the, the fullness of the, uh, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Everything is put under the feet, but it's a warfare. Paul's urging the church there that you'll know the greatness of God's power, things you can get your feet on. These are possessions. 
And so God is wanting us to, 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 to take possessions, and what we can take away from the powers of darkness will be our possessions. Your loved ones are your possessions, but they may have to be fought for. You may have to fight against the powers of darkness, but God's promised them to you, and he's promised them victory. He said, I've given them to you, but you're going to have to fight for them. Here's a possession. See, this is not the cleansing of the heart. That's God's cleansed the wilderness out of us there. But everything we get in Canaan is a possession, and we're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to fight for your children, your family, your loved ones. Whenever we help Brother Helm in all of his ministry, all that we help pray into existence for Brother Helm uh, so that there can be a great awakening will be a possession. That Holy Ghost awakening is a possession for us. If we miss the awakening, we have missed a possession. You say, Brother, I'm saved, sanctified on the way to heaven. Well, thank God, I'm glad we are, but there are possessions that God wants us to get our feet on. That's why we're striving for the great Holy Ghost awakening. And when we help Brother Helm in his ministry, we're moving toward helping toward a possession that we can possess. Souls that we have helped to get saved in a Holy Ghost awakening will be a possession to us. I tell you, I, brother, I, dear ones, if we could see, we're blinded now. God expects us to go by faith. But if we could see what all those possessions mean in eternity, I tell you, I believe we, this service would be over. We'd be dancing around. We'd be dancing and shouting and hallelujah, but we can't see it. But God expects us to do it by faith. And believe it as though it were so. I was reading something in Lori... Uh, I want to say Berkowitz and then Evans. I read her father's book and it's such a sweet little uh, story in there that her, her father tells of praying for a little child down in their school and it's so sweet. Probably maybe I ought to let you get the book and read it but I'm starting to tell you so I'll tell you. Maybe you'll get the book and buy it. Beautiful. The insight that God's used her father in so many wonderful ways. I'm sorry I missed it when he was here speaking. But he tells in that book, and maybe he even shared it here, I don't know, of a little girl had was sick, and the teacher came and said, come and pray for this little girl. And so he went down, and he tried to explain to the children what the anointed one meant. The anointed one was the king. The king was anointed. And they, he said to the children, uh, what is a king? And they said, well, a king is somebody who rules over people and can do anything he wants to do. And they said, well, Jesus is the anointed one, and he can do whatever he wants to do. So we're going to anoint this little girl, and King Jesus is going to heal her. Now, I think that's beautiful. King Jesus, he's the anointed one, and so we're going to anoint with oil, a symbol of it, so that uh, uh, he can heal her. And so they prayed for this little girl. And as he started to leave, I think the children asked him, they said, uh, well, shouldn't we thank the Lord? For healing her? You said he'd heal her, so let's just thank him for healing her. <laughs> he said, well, I think we better do that. That's wonderful. That's like children, not like children. You prayed and asked Jesus, now let's thank him for doing it. So they had a prayer of thanksgiving, and a couple days she went to the doctor and found she was perfectly well. She had been healed of leukemia. She had had leukemia in the blood, but she was perfectly well. But the children said, well, we just thank him right now. Jesus has done it, and I think that's beautiful. <clears throat> so... Uh, territory that needs every need that we need to be taken from the devil, everything that is in the devil's grasp, their possessions that belong to Jesus and us and need to be taken. Territory taken away from the enemy. He holds territory that we need to get our feet on. It says, I said, the salvation of your, your, Household, brother Oliver's intercession. What are the? What is he up there praying for? They're after possessions. They're trying to pray the Holy Ghost awakening in. 
Why? Because they're possessions that belong to the King Jesus. They're possessions that we will share in, and we're going to find in eternity that we're going to have possessions that, and I don't understand that, but I know, dear ones, there's going to be a great deal of difference in eternity. God saves us. We're all alike. We're saved by grace. But how we enjoy eternity is going to be a great difference. We're going to enjoy, all of us are going to enjoy eternity differently because of the possessions that we have had. So Brother Oliver is up praying, trying, what, to get possessions of the land that God's given. God's given it. He's given the Holy Ghost to revival. He's talked about it. He's promised it. But we're going to have to fight for it. It's ours. He's given it. But we fight for it. But it's a promise that God has given us if we'll trust God, obey God, and walk with God. He's promised. He doesn't say, now go out and try to get it. He said, I've given it to you. If you'll do what I tell you, I've given it to you. It's yours. Oh, if we could see the result of the possessions that we have. The Saturday night prayer meetings. What are they meeting here Saturday nights? They're trying to get possessions. That's what they're after. I'm trusting if God can get... It's wonderful. We need to, need, may need to pray, oh, God cleanse our hearts, and that's good. Let's get that done. But beyond that, that's not possession. We need to go beyond that and get possessions. That's what we're after on a Saturday night, and Brother Oliver up praying and, and waiting on a Holy Ghost to waken. We're after possessions that belong to Jesus the King. The world belongs to Him. He loved the world. He died for the world. And he's put it on into our hands. There are possessions out there for us to get a hold of. God, help us to see that there are possessions. We need to go after them. You fight for them. God said, you fight for them. I'll give them to you. You fight for them. They're yours. Oh, if we could see eternity. Israel trips. What are there out there? I don't know, but there are possessions there. You may not realize what possessions you're gaining, but God may show you some beautiful possessions someday that you got from going to Israel in eternity. Here it is. Here are your possessions. You gained this by going to Israel. We'd be like some of the others. Lord, when did I do that for thee? But we're going to have it revealed one of these days. So it trips to Israel. There are possessions there. Missionary work. All the missionaries that we help send out and wherever Brother Helm is sending out mission and missionaries that go, the work that accomplished. I like in Psalms, the second chapter. I'm not thinking, well, maybe I ought to turn to it. I'm not sure. Psalms, the second chapter. If we can look at it just a moment. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. God's in control of this thing. The heathen can rage and do all they want to. I don't care what's going on in Russia and China and every place else. I want you to know there's a Lord sitting in the heavens and he'll laugh at all their plans. He's laughing at them. Then he shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I given this day. Uh, have I begotten thee? Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for an inheritance. Once you notice, Jesus is the head of the body, and we're the body, and Jesus, and we're to do the very same thing. Ask of me, and I'll give you the heathen, the nations. You ask me, I'll give them to you, but you're going to have to ask me for them. Who wants the heathen? Well, I want to tell you there's a great possession out there. There is a great possession. God said, ask him for it. This is a possession. Do we want possession? Or are we satisfied simply to be saved and sanctified and on our way to heaven? I'm glad I'm going to make it, my dear ones. You've only got your feet across Jordan. You haven't gone anywhere yet. You don't go anywhere until you begin to get possessions for the kingdom of God. And this is what God is trying to save us, sanctify, cleanse our hearts. That's not our possession. Our possessions lie out there beyond the pure heart. God is moving us toward the possessions that belong to him. Ask me the heathen. I'll give you the heathen, but you're going to have to ask me for it. How many of us want the heathen? 
and the nations. He's saying this, of course, to Jesus, but it includes us. Ask him for it. I'm amazed that we have to ask for the heathen. Oh, God, that a Holy Ghost awakening should come to Africa, that a Holy Ghost awakening should come to Russia. He wants us to ask for it, that a Holy Ghost awakening come to China. Move in on it. Oh, God, their possessions, there they belong to you and they belong to us. Possessions. They're yours. They're possessions out there in the Holy Ghost awakening that are ours that I trust we can bring someday before to Jesus and stand before the throne with our possessions to, to bring them God's inheritance because they were given to us a possession. We fought for them day and night in prayer and in working and following with Jesus wherever he leads. They're our possessions. They're his, but they're ours. Oh, may God help us. Oh, what lies ahead. Saved and sanctified, wonderful. We can have a wonderful time with Jesus. But the possessions that lie ahead, down even to the older folks, there's yet laying much land to be accomplished. And you younger ones, you're getting started. But don't quit. Go for your possessions. Go for a pure heart, sure, but don't stop there. That's no stopping place. We're after possessions, and the Holy Ghost awakening is an answer to it. For God, for Jesus, and for us, there'll be a difference in eternity for you if there's a Holy Ghost awakening. If there isn't, we're going to miss something. Every one of us, in eternity, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss possessions. God said, I've given them to you. But you're going to have to fight for them. Isn't that strange? Yes. Are you going to fight for them? For the possessions. They're yours. Oh, we know how to fight for the things of the earth. But may God help us by faith to fight for the things that are possessions. So I'm going to leave us there and trusting that God will help. I don't ever like to tell what I'm preaching ahead of time, but... The Lord helping, I'm, I'll, I'll try, but unless the Lord changes it, I want to look a little more into some possessions on Wednesday night, if the Lord will help us in it. I'm trusting. So you pray for me that God will help. If that's what He wants, if not, well, we'll get into something else. Praise God.